Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very grateful to be here. I'm so glad that this conversation is taking force and that so many of you are here. I want to apologize for being late, not being with you this morning, but the NS grabbed me a five-hour ride from the Hague to here, in which I went to Breda and then to Rotterdam and Utrecht, and after visiting the whole country, I came finally <laughs> to So I hope I won't miss my train of thought in my talk, because I already missed too many trains this morning. <laughs> so I, I hope I will... Uh, I know I have 40 minutes, so I will try to get there. Uh, I want especially to thank uh, Charles um, for the invitation and Mariska and Steven for the organization and also for working closely with me to get me here. Uh, also La Internacional. I also want to thank especially Rosa and Inge that are former students of the Colonial Summer School and of mine in Middleburg because it makes me feel the presence of our community. The ideas I will be speaking today have been developed in very long-standing dialogues, often in classrooms and uh, summer schools. So they are not just my ideas in that sense. Uh, and I'm also thinking especially today of the earthquake victims in Mexico, Mexico City where I was born. I see this still and uh, well, I will encourage you to help if you can. There are many places to donate money, for example, for the victims of Mexico. Um, the title of my talk, as you can see here, with uh, I have to thank Janet Ayers for allowing me to use the photo of one of her most beautiful pieces of performance work uh, called Whip It Good. She is also teaching with us in the Decolonial Summer School. So the title of my talk, as you see, is The Museum Decoloniality and the end of the contemporary. This title already marks the route that I want to follow today in this conversation. I will speak first as a preamble of the museum and the question of our times, what I see, what is in my mind, the most urgent question for our times. Then I will introduce the, the colonial perspective what does it mean to decolonize? Today, the word is in vogue. There are many conferences using the term decolonization, and it's often used just as, a, as an adjective or just as synonym of deconstruction or synonym of postcoloniality, etc. But, but not many know what we mean by decolonization from the Latin American school of thought that has been working on, on this for 30 years. Uh, then, then I will move to the, after explaining the basic framework so that we can set the conversation, I will move to the question of the end of the contemporary, the critique of contemporaneity, and our call for the end of the contemporary. Why are we calling for the end of the contemporary? Then, finally, I will make some reflections on what is the task of the museum, how can we decolonize a museum? So that's the route for today. <laughs> I hope I won't derail. Sorry for my train imagination this morning. It's been forced into me. Um, OK. Uh, well, I want to say that we live in times of open wounds, of global injustice, and of the depletion of Earth. And that these open wounds have a lot to do with what we call modernity. Our historical times are the expression of a Eurocentric and anthropocentric model of civilization. That is what we call modernity, this project of this model of civilization that is Eurocentric in kind and anthropocentric in kind. So I will keep these two axes through my conversation. What is the problem with Eurocentrism? What is the problem with anthropocentrism? And why they are conjugated in um, in the question of modernity, or how the decolonial perspective sees modernity. I will go more into detail later. Now, for me, the urgent question of our time is an ethical question. And this ethical question is what is guiding my talk. 
and there is no ready-made answer for this question. It is for me the most urgent question. I, <coughs> it is the following. Can we live an ethical life in a historical order in which our well-being, our sense of achievement, in which our pleasures and desires are dependent on the consumption of life, of the life of others, of the life of Earth, on the exploitation of others and the extraction from and pollution of Earth. So how can we live an ethical life when we are made to enjoy the consumption of life? So I'm speaking, standing here, Global North, in the consumer society, and we know all we can be dressed and fed today in this room because there is suffering across the planet and because there is depletion of earth and, and we are made to enjoy it. Our sense of success, of, of a good life, is attached to that process of um, exploitation of others and extraction from earth. So here you see, again, the, the two strands, the monocultural strand of exploitation and the anthropocentric strand of extraction from earth. So for me, it's a very urgent question that has no easy answers today. Our whole idea of progress and development of civilization has been sustained on exploitation, <coughs> on extraction, on ecocide. So what is the role of the museum as a public space for education and preservation when it is confronted with this sort of question? What can, do, what can the museum do? Has the museum contributed to address these questions? Or has it been oblivious and complicit with global injustice and ecocide? So I, I do think we are in the times in which we have to ask these sort of questions. Questions that have not already made answers, but that are forcing us to move and to think differently. So because there is no easy answer, what I will offer here is not the solution but a path to begin understanding the museum in its modern colonial history. We need to ask how the formation of collections, narratives, and publics is implicated in coloniality. So one of the characteristics of modernity is that it is oblivious to coloniality that it builds its own narratives, but that it hides the processes that are enabling it to exist. And that's why we have not really come to these questions before, because we are just enclosing our own <coughs> epistemic territory. So to make sense of the modern, modern decoloniality, the coloniality framework, I will introduce it in very simple ways because I know most people in the audience might not be familiar to it. I will first uh, present four propositions that in my view sustain the framework, <coughs> the framework of reflection. But I, again, I want to emphasize that the, the colonial thinking is an option. We call it the decolonial option, not because it's not grounded in historical truths, but because it's, it is not attempting to become the single truth again, or to replace an ideology with another. There are other ways of thinking that are not encompassing the decolonial option that we have also to pay attention to. So the four propositions are as follow. First, how we see modernity. And modernity, unlike the Western framework of thinking that will ground it in the Industrial Revolution, or the Enlightenment, or the Reformation, we see modernity starting in 1492. For us, the time span of modernity comes from the beginning of colonial, the colonial enterprise. And I will read here a quote that I often use, because I think it's a fundamental quote for us, from Enrique Dussel, one of the main thinkers of the 
of the collective. He says like this, according to my central thesis, 1492 is the date of the birth of modernity. Modernity as such was born when Europe was in a position to pose itself against another. When in other words, Europe could constitute itself as a unified ego, exploring, conquering, colonizing an alterity that gave back its image of itself. This other, in other words, was not discovered as such, but concealed. So here you see, for us it's very simple. Before 1492, before the colonial enterprise, Europe could not think of itself as the center of the world. So if you have the Eurocentric idea of the world, in, the world map in your mind, which most of us will have, then you have a very clear example of the epistemic power of colonialism. Right? Why Europe is sitting at the center of the world map in our imagination. Right? And this is just a metaphor to show that without colonialism, Europe cannot represent itself as the center of geography and as the now of history. So Europe begins claiming the central, the privileged position of enunciation across the world, the reference point in space, and the reference point in time. And not only that, Dussel is here saying something very important, and he says that it is when Europe was in a position to pose itself against another. Also, Europe cannot understand itself without the negation of the other. But this has happened, I will explain it a bit later, better, this has happened through what I call a double negation. So Europe relegated the other to the past, to barbarism, to underdevelopment, to poverty, etc. But also erase that erasure. So in our narratives of progress and development, we erase the fact that the plantation was essential for the formation of, a, of the Atlantic economy and for global capitalism, for example, right? So we negate materially the other through oppression and exploitation, but we also erase that process from our forms of representation. Okay, the second proposition, so first proposition, 1492, the start of modernity. This also, <coughs> I have to say, in this type of context, it's not a naive interpretation of modernity. It's not that we are not aware that there is multiple modernities, contested modernities, unfinished modernities, or modernity has never been achieved, and all of that. But all those are intra-European questions. When you see modernity from the outside of the West, modernity is this project of civilization that carries a very particular uh, historical project and, and very particular consequences for the world. The second proposition is connected to what I was saying. It is a European project of civilization. It is Eurocentric in kind. And I will, um, I will speak maybe now about what we mean about Eurocentrism. We say, also, through conversations with my students, we, we reach this uh, expression that Eurocentrism is a form of arrogant ignorance. Because it's a, it assumes itself as universal, and it assumes that there is no outside its logic. Right? So there is no epistemic outside and no genealogical outside. It's epistemic territory, as I call it. This means when you speak about people that are not in Europe or that are not in the West today, having knowledge and having philosophies, <coughs> having other forms of life, you are immediately told you are romanticizing. Because everything that has been touched by modernity, and there is no such a thing as an outside modernity. However, for the colonial thought, we think there is outside of modernity. Not because modernity hasn't touched everybody in the planet, but because there are genealogies and trajectories of life and thought that do not come from Greece and Rome. Right? 
So modernity lately in the last part of the 20th century and up to today has been enclosed in this self-reflexivity. Criticism is about a reflexive move, about being critical of oneself, of its self-image. However, we think in the colonial, from the colonial perspective that this is completely insufficient. If you go to the psychoanalyst and you say that you only know yourself through yourself, you know very little about yourself, actually, right? So the moment that Europe begins listening to the others, how they see Europe, then Europe will begin to understand its place in the world, a place that is negated in its abstraction as universal is one of the tasks of the museum and I think connecting with the project of demodernizing here. So what happens when Europe begins to be seen and not be the center of seeing the world? Right? So how can we overcome this arrogant ignorance? This I think the museum in Europe has a lot to do with this task. Okay, second proposition is modernity is a European project of civilization. Third proposition, I mean, this doesn't mean also, I also have to clarify, that Europe is not diverse. Also, the project of modernity has destroyed diversity inside Europe. So Silvia Federici has shown how women with knowledge were destroyed through the Inquisition in Europe, right? How many languages were destroyed, etc. So. The project of modernity is a dominant project also inside Europe that will establish a patriarchal order, etc., and that will also exercise its power over the world. So I think there is a lot to do with the other Europes and with the question of decolonizing Europe. It's a, it's a question for the next summer school. The third proposition, this is a very important one, essential for our thinking, coming from Aníbal Quijano, is that there is no modernity without coloniality. And this is what I was already saying, that we cannot think of the history of progress and development of civilization without the history of enslavement, plantation, extraction. They are connected. In our universities, they are separate because we don't want to connect. Then the, the fifth proposition, the fourth proposition, is that decoloniality, so what comes out of, modern, of understanding modern decoloniality and how they are articulated, I will speak about that, is what we call decoloniality. And decoloniality is, is an orientation and a practice that doesn't want to be included in modernity. We don't want to be modern. Because for us, modernity is a Western project of civilization that is implicated in coloniality. So we are not fighting for the recognition of being modern or the recognition of contemporary. Right? We don't want to be modern. We want to overcome modernity, the order of modernity coloniality. So you see, the movement of decoloniality is what Walter Mignolo calls a movement of delinking. So we are not fighting for recognition. We are not saying we want our history to be recognized as part of the global history of modernity, that we are also modern. I think that's a very valid strategy from other geographies, but from our perspective, we don't want to be modern. Right? And that's not to take a backward or traditional position. Okay, uh, <coughs> the coloniality as well is the overcoming of this modern colonial order has to do with dignification, with the struggles for dignity. If you look at social movements across the global south, also in Europe, the south in Europe and the south in the US and Canada, like the First Nations, uh, they are all struggles for dignification. They are fighting for dignity through struggles for land, for women's rights, for human rights, etc. But at the center, we see a struggle for dignity. 
So the coloniality is about enabling other worlds to become world. What modernity has done is to suppress the possibility of other worlds to become world. To reclaim the possibility of naming and inhabiting the world. To be able to embody and experience those other worlds. The coloniality has to do with the question of the vernacular and with verba verbality, not with having or taking, not with the object, but with the verb, with being with others and being able to make worlds or worlding the world. Okay, let me go now in, a bit into detail of what we mean by the modern colonial. When we say modernity cannot be separated from coloniality. It's true we write it together, modernity coloniality, we write it with a slash. But it's very important to see that they designate distinct moment, movements. They are distinct moments and movements towards a real. So modernity is, has a particular movement historical movement and coloniality, another one, even though they are completely uh, interdependent. Modernity, in my mind, is about the control of presence, the control of world historical reality. What appears as world is what modernity is controlled, right? It's from its institutions to its forms of subjectivity, to its sciences. It has, for me, this movement of controlling presence has, for me, two different uh, movements as well, or moments, the moment of appropriation. So modernity materially has been about the appropriation of land, the massive appropriation of what the Europeans will call the Americas, is the largest appropriation of land in history and the appropriation of earth through extractivist practices, through sciences, all sorts of things, the appropriation of life, the appropriation of humans and non-humans. So there's a very tangible process of appropriation. And next to this process of appropriation, or this moment, there is a moment of representation. So modernity controls materially the force of appropriation, what it will <coughs> it will accompany it with a movement of representation. And it is the control of knowledge, of epistemology, of narratives, the control of the spectacle. Right? So modernity will do certain things tangibly, like the plantation for the extraction of human life and nature's life. And at the same time, it will represent it as progress and development. Right? So, appropriation and representation are working together all the time. Or will bomb places in the name of human rights, right? These type of things. So that's modernity, controlling presence, what's happening in the world. Coloniality is speaking about something else. Coloniality is speaking about the absencing of the other. So whereas modernity, controls the presence in the world. Coloniality is a movement of absence. It is all sorts of processes of denigration, exploitation, extraction, racialization, and this double erasure I have been talking about. So when we ask the question of coloniality, it's very different than when we ask the question of modernity. When we ask the question of modernity, we see how power is operating tangibly. And this is a question of critical social sciences and philosophies and arts in the West. But when we ask the question of coloniality, we ask the question of what has been lost. And this the West has never asked. <coughs> what is being lost? What is being, as I wrote in one of my articles, what is being defutured? Right? What is being stopped from becoming world? Just a quick note, it's a very, 
famous uh, term today, the Anthropocene. I wrote uh, an article about the Anthropocene and the coloniality. And it's uh, striking that the, the scientists, the geologists that are looking for markers of the Anthropocene, of the geological epoch where humanity is marking the life of Earth, that they found that in 1600, there is what they call the Orbis spike, a drop in CO2 decline. And this 1620 corresponds exactly to the unfolding of colonialism. And why is this big drop in CO2 decline that they can measure in the ice caps? Well, the geologists found that it is due to the death of three quarters of the population of the Americas and Africa. So we now have a geological confirmation of coloniality. <clears throat> we now know with all clarity that the unfolding of colonialism meant genocide, right? To such an extent that it marked the earth. So you see the thesis of, of Dussel saying 1492 is the start of modernity coincides with the logic of the Anthropocene, an anthropocentric logic, one of destruction of life. Right? Okay, that was just a, a pause to reflect on this. Um, because I think it's important to have it in the conversation about the Anthropocene that is also so much in vogue today. Okay, I will go into how modernity, if we distinguish the movement of modernity and the movement of coloniality, What's happening when they are conjugated? And here, we speak of the colonial difference. In, we say that the relation to alterity, to the other, that is essential for the configuration of modernity as a self, or Eurocentrism as a self, is negotiated through what we call the colonial difference. And this goes back to the ethical question because we have come to see that even our notions of pleasure, desire, and beauty are constructed in the exclusion and consumption of alterity. <coughs> I will speak of three axes of differentiation of this relation to alterity. The axis of the human and nature, so the separation between the human and nature, that will have important effects on Earth. The axis of Eurocentrism or whiteness, and the other, as the racialized, the enslaved, the impoverished, an important effect in people. <coughs> and the axis of time, which is the now, the definition of the now that is very important for our question of contemporaneity, because the now also attains its definition through alterity. The now is only defined through seeing the other as traditional, as passé, as backward, as a belated copy. So this axis of separation, you see how they work, Eurocentrism will rule, or the monoculture of the West, speaking more generally, will rule over the relation of the others and will lead us to what I call worldlessness, the loss of worlds, the position of a single world and the loss of the diversity of worlds. <coughs> then, we will have anthropocentrism, ideas of science, reason, and culture that will rule over the relation to the earth. And this will lead us, or is leading us towards earthlessness, what I call earthlessness. Finally, important for today, contemporaneity, the notions of novelty, of immanence and futurity 
will rule over the relation to time. And they will lead us into oblivion, into massive forms of forgetfulness. So you see how these three axes of separation define, begin defining modernity in a different light. Modernity as, appears as worthlessness, as earthlessness, and as oblivion. Escobar has a, Arturo Escobar has a beautiful phrase that says, globalization has taken place at the expense of relational worlds. So the destruction of worlds, the ecocide, and the forgetfulness, the destruction of our access to the past as a site of experience, characterize modernity. We also leave these as subjects because the subject in modernity, the modern subject, lives his, her life separated in a force that is separating it from the communal, from the relation with others into individuality, from earth into anthropocentrism and the consumption of life and not the care of, for life, and into also the modern subject is being separated from its inner life, an inner life that is plural, that is communal, and that is beyond the human as well. OK, I need to move a bit faster. Um, you need to go slow in these things too. Uh, so with the relation of, to time, because I want to address this question of the end of the contemporary, I will read a little quote of what I wrote for the for our event in Berlin called Staging the End of the Contemporary. So I will summarize a bit what I had to explain. The contemporary has been a normative position within the arts since the second half of the 20th century. The emergence of the global contemporary towards 1989 opened a critique of Eurocentrism in the field of contemporary art, but left the normativity of the contemporary untouched. What remained untouched and at the same time became globalized was the normativity of modern time. Yes. So this is um, our key question to contemporary art is how it has become a normative field that uh, that is attached to the modern notion of chronology, of novelty, of the radically empty present. So listening to the philosophies of Abhya Yala, what we, the West calls Americas, uh, I have developed a concept that is called the notion of precedence. And the notion of precedence, or the question of precedence, is a way to break the binary between immanence and transcendence. It is a way to relate to deep temporalities in which what precedes us is not immanent, is not just in the present now, but is both ahead of us, because it precedes us, but it is before us as well. And this is a notion of time that you find in the whole of, uh, not in the whole, but in many philosophies of the Americas. And for me, the philosophical framework of the West that has been trapped in the dichotomy between immanence and transcendence cannot understand. Because it is a relation to time in which what precedes us or the before is before us. You see, the before is before and before us or the, what precedes us is ahead of us and before us. Right? So that's a big discussion. We can discuss about it when we talk a bit later. Uh, so what is the colonialist thesis about? And then I will go quickly to the museum. OK. I think what is important here is to say that the colonialist thesis is not about seeking novelty or contemporary. 
the colonial aesthetics is about disobeying the chronology of modernity, and I say it comes under the sign of the return. What a radical return that is capable of breaking open the order of the present. So, the museum has been, in my mind, or very clearly as well, the museum has been enacting the colonial difference in the ways I have been speaking about. It has been constituting other worlds as alterity. And it has been also a mechanism for the formation of the normative self, of the normative position, of the absent universal position. So what is needed, I find, is the humbling of modernity, a concept I developed to speak about the necessity for modernity to drop its universal claim. But not only that, as a condition for modernity and the West to begin listening to other worlds of meaning. How can the museum undo the white Western gaze? How can it undo its position of abstraction of this gaze? How can it reveal its negated positionality? How can it come to terms with its geohistorical <coughs> positionality and then reach towards responsibility? So decolonizing the museum in the light of this thinking, I think has a task to unlearn the narrative of its own history, its own self-made narrative, and engage in the task of humbling modernity. And I think here there is very strong connection with the modernizing that I see as a necessary step for the museum to begin listening. First, it needs to, to humble its own narrative, to recognize the limits of its own episteme so that it can begin listening by first positioning itself, recognizing its, its task in the modern colonial difference. We are all positioned. The fact that we call ourselves an option is also because when you are an option, there is no universal ahead of you. The others are also options, and we are all located somewhere. So how can we position the canon, the narratives, the collections, and the publics? Because the museums have been complicit with the production of publics in the image of this empty subject of this white Western gaze. This arrogant ignorance is being reproduced through the production of these politics. So then there are policies that become unable to understand the other side of the colonial difference and that become ignorant to the world. So the museum, I think, has to recognize itself as being implicated in the modern colonial order and take responsibility from there. This notion of being implicated is something that has been very strongly suggested by, by uh, the colonial feminists, black feminists, and Chicano feminists. Because when you're in a position of abstraction, you take no responsibility. When you're in this place of nowhere, when you have the power to see and not being seen, as Donna Harwood says. Also, the third point for decolonizing the museum, I think, and connects with the decolonial thesis, is a question of listening. For me, we are entering a time where we have to stop focusing on enunciation and saying the radically new and begin listening. We have to learn to listen. And also, for that, you need to learn to be quiet. Mm -hmm. How can we listen to what has been made silent, invisible, irrelevant? By our own narratives, right? So I will finish with this. The decolonial critique is cracking open the present 
and or the presentism of modernity to illuminate already existing alternative genealogies and paths into the to come. Thank you very much.